you are on mute. Okay, a very good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning. Um, what we are going to see today, our main scripture reading will be First Samuel chapter 17, from verse 1 to verse 54. 1 Samuel chapter 17, from verse 1 to verse 54. Uh, so Sister Lee in the Giles will read it for us, first of all, and then uh, I can take it from there. Sister Lee Giles, please. Now the Philistines gathered the armies together to battle, <coughs> excuse me, and were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between Soko and Ezekiel in Ephes Daman. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Eda and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side. And the Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear, which was like a weaver's beam and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels and a shield bearer went before him. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for the battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, David was a son of the Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, who had eight sons. And the man was old, advanced in years in the days of Saul. The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to the battle. The names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, next to him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem, and the Philistine drew near and presented himself forty days, morning and evening. Then Jesse said to his son David, Take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and these ten loaves, and run to your brothers at the camp. And carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousand, and see how your brothers fare, and bring back news of them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. So David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper, and took the things, and went to Jess and went as Jesse had commanded him, and came to the camp as the army was going out to fight and shouting for battle. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn, drawn up in, army array, in battle array, army against army, and David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper and ran to the army and came and greeted his brothers. Then, as they talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words. 
So David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel, and it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with his great riches, will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Is there not a cause? Then he turned from him toward another and said the same thing, and these people answered him as the first ones did. Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are youth and he a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. So Saul clothed David with his armor and he put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook, and put them in a shepherd's bag in the pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand. And he drew near to, he drew near to the Philistine. <clears throat> So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good-looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog, that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day... The Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So it was, when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. 
Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Now the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley and to the gates of Ekron, and the wounded of the Philistines fell along the road to Sharim, even as far as Gath and Ekron. Then the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistine, and they plundered their tents, and David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. Amen. Thank you very much, Sister Lean Giles, from, uh, for your reading from uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, from 1 to 54. That was 1 Samuel chapter 17, from verse 1 to verse 54. Now, what we want to see today, um, inspired from that uh, chapter, is why what and how i say again why what and how sister rosemary can you mute yourself okay good yeah so the why the what and the how. By why, by why, I mean, what is uh, the motivation behind our actions? What is uh, the motivation or the reasons behind our actions? Uh, when we are dealing in Christianity, we are dealing with God, first of all. We are dealing with uh, our fellow humans as well. So we have a relationship with God and we have a relationship with our fellow humans. And in all, all kinds of relationships that we need to have with God or with our fellow human, uh, it should be always a win-win relationship. It is always a win. It is not a one-sided relationship and it will never be a one-sided relationship. Even when you with God, it is never a one-sided relationship relationship and if we miss it then uh, basically we are going to be frustrated in our christian uh, walk it is never a one-sided relationship it is always a two-sided relationship uh, though god initially um, is the one who initiates the relationship uh, but there should be a reciprocity for that relationship to continue so God has his why or his reasons or his motivations behind his actions, behind his deeds. We also have our whys or our motivations, our reasons behind uh, our actions. There is also the what. Uh, what is it? Uh, what is in it for me? What are the benefits that God will get if he does this thing for us? And what are also the benefits or the blessings and every other thing that we would enjoy if we choose to do what God is telling us to do? So what is in it for me? That's our what. And God also has his what. And then the how. Now that I know the motivations of God, the whys of God, and God also knows my motivations, uh, I, I know the Ben, what is in it for me? What is in it for God? I also know, uh, I need not to know how. How are we going to carry out that plan? How or 
uh, what is God now expecting from me, the doing part, and how to do it, basically, so that I can enjoy those benefits. But in our Christian walk, the how should be based on uh, what God told us. God already knows how we are supposed to do it. Many times when we come to Christ in the beginning, our reasons are different from God's reasons, but that's okay. In the beginning, that's okay. The, uh, when we are dealing also with people in our relationships in the beginning, our motivations are different than um, the motivation of the other person, but that's okay in the beginning. But as the relationship with God develops, as if we want that relationship to continue and not just to be something that is uh, temporal, we need our why, the reason or our motivation now to line up with the motivations of God. We become one. We need also uh, the how, the ways to accomplish that thing, to be in sync with uh, the ways of God. Your ways are not my ways. Isaiah says, your thoughts are not my thoughts. So we, need, we are the one that we need to change to pick up the ways of God, the thoughts of God. And as we continue to walk with God, our wise would be the wise of God, our what would be the words of God, uh, and then our how would be also the house of God. But the what, we will still benefit God also, we still benefit from that relationship. We, for the dealings also with people, uh, we will be benefiting from that relationship they also will be benefiting it always should be a win-win relationship with god not a one-sided relationship with god so we are going to use that um, first Samuel chapter 17 as one of the examples uh where we will see the why the what and the how both on god's side and then on uh, uh david's side and you're also uh, going to ask yourself those three questions. Whenever you are going to read the Bible, you need always to ask those three questions so that you know what, what are your true motivations and uh, what is the motivation of God for doing that for you? What are your benefits and what will God benefit from it and how God wants you to carry that uh, out so that you can enjoy those benefits in the name of Jesus. Now, if we focus first of all on this text of uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17 from 1 to 57. Now, what is the motivation of God? The why of God? Why is God interested in uh, delivering his people? God had a problem. God has a problem. God has a problem. And uh, today also God has a problem. God wanted to rule his nation, to be king over the nation. But the people decided to have a king like uh, uh, the other pagan nations. So God did not like it. Uh, that's what we call the permissive will of God. So God gave them a king. He was displeased, but he gave them a king. The reason why he gave them the king was because the sons of uh, Eli of, and, and uh, Samuel also his son were misbehaving. People who did not want the priest of God to be the one leading them anymore. They wanted the king like uh, the other king. So because it was the priest of God that was at fault, God also could not really blame the people. So in his displeasure, he gave them a king. But he wanted a king that would be after his own heart, a king that would love him. The motivation of God for everything that he does is love. The motivation of God for everything that he does is love. Many times our motivation is not love yet. But God will try to, uh, to make our motivation line up now with his motivation. That is the purpose of all of our Christian journey. That our motivations, our wives will be the same why of Jesus' love. So God had a problem. He was looking for a king that would be over his people, but that king will have um, all his heart for God so that he would be able to lead his people according to his uh, uh, Bible. 
So that was the problem that God had. So he gave them soul initially, and soul was more concerned about him, his reputation, uh, how will people think about him? So he disobeyed God, and God said, I regretted that I appoint, appointed the soul to be king. So God was now looking for a man to replace uh, King Saul. God was looking for a man that loved him truly. A man that loved him truly. And he said to Samuel, I found the son of Jesse. In chapter 16 of Samuel, I found the son of Jesse, David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, a man who truly loves me. And he will do all my will. And like a king soul that keeps on disobeying me, this man that I found, David, he will do all my will. So that's why Jesus explained to us, if you truly love God, you would obey his command. It is not you are going to sing for him, you are going to give him money. Mm -mm -mm. If you truly love God, you will reciprocate that love by obeying his command. So the reason why David was a man after God's own heart, God himself said to Samuel, he's going to do all my will. That's why he's a man after my own heart. I found him. So he cares too much about how people perceive him. Uh, he cares too much about the praise of people that he keeps on disobeying me, disobeying me, and thinks by giving me more offering and tithe, that's what matters to me. First uh, Samuel chapter 15 from verse 22, to obey obedience is better than sacrifice. So God had that problem. He wanted to find someone who truly loves him, that would, that he would be able to set over his people. Because the Bible says, like people, like a priest, like people, like a king. The people just imitate the, the leaders. So if the leader truly loves God, the people will be imitating him, and they also will be loving God like the leaders. If the leader is disobeying, the people also that are under the leader, they would also be disobeying. So that's why God was looking for a man that will love him back will, by doing all his will. And he found David, the son of Jesse, the Ephraimite of the tribe of Judah. So that's what was the reason of God. God loved these people. He wanted his people to be ruled. Uh, so what was it in it for God? What was uh, the benefit that God would get from uh, David? Because if he put David in power, if he exalts David above uh, uh, Saul, he starts making David look good, making David look like the hero of Israel, people would be now imitating uh, David. And people would now be obeying God like David obeys God. So that's what God is having as a benefit, the profit of God by exalting uh, David. And how will he do that? That's the strategy, first of all, killing a lion, killing a bear, uh, killing a Goliath, and ultimately defeating his 10,000, while Saul is only defeating the 1,000. So that was the plan of God. Now, what was the plan of David? <laughs> what was the why of David? What was the, the what of David? And what was the how of David? Now, the motivation of David or his wise, it was not because he, he so loved God. Of course, in uh, verse um, 29 of uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, he says, what? What have I done? Is there not a cause? Yes, there was a cause. Israel was being uh, uh, threatened by the enemies of God, the Philistines. Yes, there was a cause. Israel was uh, hiding for 40 days and 40 nights. They were being insulted. The God was being taunted. There was a real cause. But even if there was a real cause, it was not enough for David to go fight. Was he a man after God's own heart? Yes. God himself testified, he will do all my will. But even if I would do all the will of God, why would I go and fight Goliath? To protect the reputation of God, yes. But why can someone else do it? Then David moves to the next stage. What is in it for me? If I go fight Goliath, what is in it for me? What are the benefits that I'm going to get? 
David was always uh, straightforward in his dealing with God. And he heard the king said in the, from, chap, from verse uh, uh, 25 uh, to verse uh, 27, the Bible says the three times David asked, what will the king do to the one who defeated this uncircumcised Philistine that is taunting uh, Israel and insulting our God? What will the king or what is my reward? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Because he that comes to God, he must believe that God is or God exists and he's the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So David knew exactly if he fights the battle of the Lord, the Lord will reward him. So I need to know what is the reward. I'm a man after God's own heart. I will do all the will of God. Yes. God has found a man after his own heart. He found a reason. Okay, good. God has his... Uh, uh, how do you call it, uh, the word of God, God would, through me, the people would be serving the Lord, and so on and so forth, and how will God do that by starting to defeat uh, Goliath and the Philistine, so that I would become the hero of the people, yes, but what is in need for me? Why will I go and do all the, uh, the, the, those fights for the Lord? What will I benefit? So they say to him, okay, first of all, the king will en uh, enrich greatly the man who defeated Goliath. Okay, money is indeed. Okay, that's a good thing. He was a 17-year-old boy, so money is in it. That's a good thing. And then they said to him, his father, the third thing they said, his father's uh, house will be exempted from taxes. He said, I'm a 17-year-old. Well, taxes is for my dad because all the flock, belongs to my dad, the cheese factory and uh, the, the field, the farm belongs to my dad. So it's my dad that pays taxes, not me and my brother that are adults that will be paying taxes from the salary from the army. So me, truly I'm a child. So exemption from taxes for my family, ah, that's not interesting. Money, yeah. And then the second thing they say, you see the princess, the daughter of the, of the king, he would give the, uh, her hand in marriage to that, uh, that man who defeated Goliath. He said, now you are talking. He looked at that lady. Oh, she was beautiful. He said, oh, I need to ask again. Because by mouth of two or three witnesses, every word must be established. So he asked the second time, tell me again. He went to ask someone else, tell me again. What will be done to the man who defeated this Goliath? They say to him the same thing. They would uh, enrich him greatly. Okay, that's what the king would have said. They would give him the daughter of the king as a, a wife. Say, mm -hmm, now you are talking. Your father's house will be exempted from taxes. Say, mm -hmm, now you are talking. You went and asked the third time until the matter came to the ears of the king. There is a young man who is asking, what will be done? The man that defeated Goliath. So the king now called for him. So you see, David did not go to fight because he loved God. Because he was trying to defend the reputation of God. The name of God was being insulted for 14 days. No, it was not enough for David. And God knows exactly that in the beginning of our Christian journey, the love motivation is not our motivation. It's first of all, the reward. Peter did not follow Jesus because he loved Jesus. No. Luke chapter 5. Peter followed Jesus because he got a miracle in his fishing business. That's why I have no problem when people come because they are looking for marriage, they are looking for immigration, they are looking for everybody comes to God mainly because of the what. What, they, what is in need for them. And the role of the church, because we are representatives of God, is to, to deliver your needs your benefits for coming into the kingdom, but ultimately to turn your heart to God so that you would reciprocate the love that he has shown you. Because the reason why God is delivering you is prospering the business of, um, of, um, of, uh, of uh, Peter. It is so that Peter can surrender his life to Jesus. And that's what happened. 
Peter surrendered his life to Jesus. And if we lose that focus, then we just give people the, what they need without turning the heart back to God. Then God is not getting uh, uh, a profit out of that relationship. God needs to win. We also need to win. It is a win-win. So as we read, the David got defeated Goliath. The wife was given out. As you continue to read, God, uh, the king gave him uh, money and uh, gave him uh, one of his daughters as a, to, to marry. And then also his family was exempted from taxes. Then how did God uh, do that? The strategy. The strategy is not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So the king, uh, king Saul wanted to give him his armor, but that was the armor of flesh. David said, I've never used that before. So I can't fight with that. But God trained me with the stone of the word of God. And I know this is enough. It may look like nothing, but this is enough. My God that defeated the lion with the same stone and the sling, he defeated the bear. He would also defeat the, the, the same this, uh, uncircumcised uh, Philistines with the same uh, weapon. So that was the how, the method that God used or the ways of God to achieve that result. God is not just lifting you because uh, uh, of you. God needs to take, have a profit, the benefit in your exaltation. As we saw yesterday on Saturday, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were 10 times better than all the others, not because they were Jews, they were other Jews. But God exalted them in a position of power because when they did not bow, the laws of the Holy Land changed. They were governors of provinces and uh, Daniel was above all the other governors, above all the, uh, the, the magicians. So that his tense about uh, the word of God, his un uh, uncompromised stance about the word of God caused the laws of the kingdom to make an exception for the Jews. There were other nations that were captives also in Babylon. There were other nations that also had their gods. So they wanted them to serve all the other gods because they were captives. But the stance of those uh, four Hebrew boys caused the Babylonian empire to make an exception for the group called the Jews, that they should no longer be bothered. Let them serve the, the God and only the God. The reason why God is exalting you, lifting you, it is so that you can be his representative and draw people to him because he wants to save as many souls as he can for you, for your testimony. So if God cannot win something in that relationship, in that miracle, then he's not likely to do that. What is in it for me? It should not be a one-way relationship with God. It should not be a, a one-way relationship with people either. Love must be the foundation of uh, our dealings with people. That is the foundation of our dealing with God. Love, 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 love. And ultimately, as God gives us our businesses, he gives us our... Um, our immigration, he wants us to love him back because he has to love that. He initiates the love. Even from the book of Genesis chapter one to Genesis chapter three, we will see this, the why, the what, and the how of God also. What was in the heart of God from Genesis chapter one to Genesis chapter three? So that we will see the three wise. From the beginning, it was already there. God did not hide it at all. The plan of God was to create a family. God wanted to start a family. Angels are not sons. They are servants. Uh, all the archangels, the, the four, four living creatures, the seraphim, and the, all those wonderful creatures that are in heaven, they are not sons of God. We are sons of God. They are not created in the image of God. We are creating the image of God and we are creating the likeness of God. So God in his mind, he wanted to have a family, a new species 
of people that to be in the God class. Uh, they are not God, but they are in the God class, meaning they have a will of their own. And a group of people that would stay with him because they love him back, not because they are forced to stay with him. Angels have uh, no will of their own initially. Initially, that's how they were created. That's why they cannot be saved. Those who disobeyed in the rebellion with Lucifer, they were cast out of heaven forever. They can never be redeemed again. Cast out of heaven forever. So those who stayed with him, Gabriel and all the, the Michael and all the other two thirds of the angels, they stayed there because they made that choice. When God created us, he gave us a choice either to stay with him because we love him. That was, that's why there was a tree of good and evil. So the good the tree of good and evil and then the tree of uh, eternal life. We decided to be separated forever, willingly. The devil only whispered, but we acted and we partook of the other tree. So God, by creating us, it was because he loved us. All the creation of the universe, it was as if uh, you were pregnant, just like uh, some of the, the sisters and the couples that when they are pregnant, the very time that they know that they are pregnant, they start to decorate the room, they start to buy the crib, they buy the baby clothes. So all those planets, those galaxies and so on and so forth, it is like a, a, a crib that God is creating for the man that is about to, to bring on earth. He was pregnant with you because he loved you. They consulted uh, the three of them. They said, let us make man in our image, in our own likeness. Angels were scratching the head in uh, Psalm chapter eight. They said, okay, we know about uh, Seraphine. We know about Archangel. We know about normal angel. We know about the, the four living creatures. We know about Lucifer that was uh, kicked out of heaven with all his pipe instruments. But what is man that God will be so mindful of him? And what is the son of man that God would visit him in the cool of the day, in the cool of the night? So the reason why God created uh, mankind was because he loved that mankind. He wanted the family. Love was behind it. For what reason God wanted fellowship? God wanted fellowship. There was no sacrifice in the Garden of Eden. God wanted to spend time. When truly we love one another, we need to talk to one another. Man had nothing to offer back to God, no money. All the garden belonged to God. Everything belonged to God. So God just wanted fellowship. There was no tithe. There was no offering in the Garden of Eden. None of that. Tithe and offering started after the scene when uh, uh, Cain, they, were, they were kicked out of the garden and uh, Cain and Abel offered the first sacrifice. Before the fall, there was no sacrifice. In heaven, there will be no sacrifice. God just wanted fellowship. He just wanted to spend time with you. When someone loves you, he wants to spend time with you. And if you love God, you would want to spend time with God in prayer. You want to talk to that person as much as you can because you love that person. The, so the motivation of God, the why of God was love. He wanted to start a family. Uh, the what of God or what was in need for him? Fellowship. He was after fellowship. He wanted to come and talk to mankind and discuss with mankind, take the input of mankind that was in the God class. He's not a God, but he's in the God class. And how did he do that? He started to create that environment he spoke uh, let there be light, let there be. So when he said, let there be light, he said it was good. The first day it was good. The second day it was good. The third, the fourth, the fifth, it was good. It was good. But that was not the climax of his creation. The climax of his creation was uh, mankind. When he created mankind on the sixth day, he said it was uh, very good. And then he rested. Now he could enjoy his creation. He could enjoy the man that he has made in his own image. He could come and fellowship with them. An angel was so jealous, as I've explained the preferential plan one. That's why Lucifer hates mankind, because he was not created in the image of God, neither in the likeness of God. We are in the God class. 
We are not gods, but we are in the God class. That's why he wants you to sin so that you will be under his feet instead of him being under your feet. As it is explained, the perfect redemption plan one. So we have even from Genesis 1 to Genesis chapter 3, the why of God, love was the motivation. What was God after? He was after fellowship with him. He was never after your money. He wanted fellowship with him. He wanted you to love him back. And still today, God wants you to love him back. And then uh, how did he do that? By, uh, by creating you, creating the atmosphere for you and every day your environment. He, he gave them dominion over the works of his uh, creation. He gave them everything. God doesn't love you because of your money or because, because of anything that you can give to him. He loves you from the bottom of your heart, of, of his heart, and he just wants you to reciprocate his love initially. So that was in Genesis from one to three. Now, what was it in it for mankind? Why will mankind have to reciprocate the love of God by obeying his commandment? Why? Why will Adam? So if they uh, obey his commandment, they are going to stay with him forever. Mankind was created to live forever. You are an eternal uh, spirit. So when your life ends here, either you are with God forever in heaven, or you are with the devil forever in hell. Life does not end here. They still had a choice to partake of uh, uh, the tree of knowledge and uh, of good and evil, or to partake of the tree of uh, eternal life. They chose because if there is love, you must have a choice. God does not force us. You must have a choice. That's why the word those two trees. Because otherwise, people blame God. I did not have a choice. I did not want to stay in this house. I did not want to stay in that relationship with God. You always have a choice. Even in uh, Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son had a choice to walk away out of the house of the father. And the father did not uh, ask his servant to bind him so that he would stay at home. He left. But when he came back, he came back because he knew his father loved him. Love is always what draws us uh, to God. And God is wanting his son and his daughters back uh, home. If we understand the heart of God from the very beginning, the reason why God does everything, then we are going to be able to preach this gospel effectively in the name of Jesus. So God was after a family. Now, why will we love God back for Adam and Eve in those days? They would have dominion. What was it in it for, for them? They would have dominion over the works of God's hand. They would be blessed. Everything that they did was blessed and everything that they did was prospering. But when they sinned, the curses started to happen in their life. So how were they supposed to do it so that they can enjoy the blessing? It was by keeping the commandment of the Lord. In the book of Exodus, uh, chapter 23, from verse uh, 25 to 26, he says, if you serve me, God says, if you serve me or if you worship me in spirit and in truth, of course, I, in a return, your benefit, what I will do for you, I will bless your bread, I will bless your water, and I will take sickness away from your midst. So God knows that uh, we have, like Jesus says in that Matthew chapter 6, he knows that we have a need of those things. God is not shy about those things. No, 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 no. He knows exactly we have a need of those things. It should be a win-win relationship with him. But he needs to win as well. We need to win as well. He wanted a king that would uh, lead his people in the way of righteousness. King Saul had disappointed him. He found now uh, David, a man after his own heart, that will do all his will. Okay, what is he need for David? He said, okay, you will get the wife, you will get the money, and then you would uh, be exempted from taxes. David said, now you are talking, now I can go and fight. But ultimately, as we see the relationship of, of uh, uh, David uh, progressing with God, it was no longer about the money. It was no longer about the wife. It was no longer about exemption from taxes. He just delighted in the Lord. 
delight yourself in the Lord your God. Psalm 37, verse 4. If you truly please the Lord, delight, to delight or to please yourself in the Lord your God by obeying his command as a, a return to perfect redemption plan, God will give you all the desires of your heart because he knows that you need to win also in that relationship and he also need to win. Now, we are going to see the example of Father Abraham. You will see that in Genesis chapter 12, Genesis chapter 15, and Genesis chapter 22. The why, the what, and the how. God had a need. And he needed to win in that situation. And he had a method to bring it about. Abraham also has a need. And he also needed to win in that relationship. And he needed to bring it about the how, the way God wanted it to be brought about. What was the problem of God? God was looking for a righteous family. A righteous family. God is after your family. He's after your marriage. Abraham was a pagan. His name was Abram, exalted father. His name was rooted in the Chaldeans uh, idol worship. That's why God had to change his name from Abram to Abraham and put the blessing on his name. He was an idol worshiper. But among those idol worshippers, he was among some of the idol worshippers that were trying to seek the truth. Abraham had a problem. He was a barren. He was a barren. He could not conceive with his wife. God says, okay, if you want a child, me also, I want a child. I want a child for whom I will bring prophetically my seed, uh, uh, Jesus. And you don't have a child. So let us make a deal. It will be a win-win. I am the Lord God Almighty. You read like Exodus chapter 6 says, he revealed himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai, the almighty God. You don't need Tammuz, the goddess of fertility. You don't need uh, the God of the Philistines. You don't need the God of the Chaldeans. You don't need the God of the rain. You don't need Mammon, the God of prosperity. I am all in all. My name is El Shaddai, the almighty God, the double-breasted one. Whatever you need, come to me. And you need a child, you need prosperity, you need all those things. I will give it to you. These are the benefits. What is it uh, in need for you? The money will be there. The child will be there. And so on and so forth. Servant, you become even the prince. What is in it for me? I'm looking for a child that is born in righteousness and I'm after your whole family also. So Genesis chapter 12 from verse one to verse three, I command you leave the idol worship of your family. You must be born again in other words. So leave your father's house and go to a place that I will show you. And then I will multiply you, I will bless you, I will bless those who bless you, I will curse those who curse you and in you. And for your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So that's what I want. I'm after your son because I need the Messiah to come through a righteous family. Do you understand what I want? Abraham said, yes, I understand. So Abraham packed his luggage and went. We, on, we have a deal. It's a contract with God. God is winning. I am winning. I want a child. All the idols of my family did not give me a child. So I'm going with God. I'm trying this God, I will, El Shaddai. So he obeyed. And then in chapter, you lived in righteousness. And God came and uh, reaffirmed the terms of the contract again. In Exodus chapter 18, sorry, in Genesis chapter 18, Genesis chapter 18, God says, he was about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. I said, should I hide anything from God? God will not hide his motives from you. He will not. Once you understand that God is after something, if he wants a win-win relationship, go and now start and share the secrets with you, what he's really after. He said, should I hide anything from Abraham? He's seeing he's going to inherit everything. So he's going to inherit this land. I'll even give him the whole nation. But I have commanded him. He did not suggest anything to him. When I was in Tanzania, they had a big revelation when I was there. And they came and said to us, you preach differently. The way you preach is as if these ones are commands. I say, it is, these are commands. They are not suggestions. These are commands. If you diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God, which he commands you today, not which he suggests to you. He does not suggest things to us. He commands us things. 
then all these blessings, they will come upon you and they will overtake you. Deuteronomy chapter 28 from verse 1 to 2. And then you can list all those things. You'll be the head and not the tail. These are no suggestions. These are commands. So in Exodus chapter 18, he says, the reason why I'm revealing things to Abraham, I'm telling him my secret, what I want, my reason why I'm doing that, what I will get out of it, and how I want it to be done, is because I've already commanded him to teach his children and all his household after him to walk in the path of righteousness. That's the only way I would be able to reveal all my plans to Abraham. If he has no intention of walking in righteousness and uh, having his whole family to serve me as well, why will I bother giving him that child? Now, the problem of Abraham, he was missing it on the how, the way to go about it. David in that first Samuel chapter 17 did not miss it. He removed the armor of uh, King Saul and took the sling and uh, the stone that God gave him. But in Father Abraham, he wasted 25 years of his life because he was trying to do that uh, by the flesh, not the ways of God. He tried first of all, let me try adoption. My nephew Lot is there. In case God does not give me a child, I can adopt uh, my, my, my nephew Lot. As long as you have a plan B. Well, God would wait until you have exhausted your plan B and then you come back to him. So why not cut, uh, cut uh, the plan B, C, D loose and then say, God, what is your plan? Because I'm tired of wasting my time. What is your plan? How are we supposed to accomplish it? He had another plan C. He had uh, Hagar. And did he have a, a Ishmael? And Ishmael is still a problem today to the Jewish people and to the Christians. They are always fighting the son of the promise. And then finally he gave up. He said, God, how are we supposed to do that? Go say your wife, Sarah, will give you a child. And they were laughing. I'm a man of integrity, God says. Why are you laughing? By the, this time next year when I come, She'll be with a child. The method must be the method of God. Otherwise, we will keep on wasting time, 25 years for Abraham. And my prayer is that you will no longer waste time in the name of Jesus. And I will no longer waste the time either in the name of Jesus. I would truly understand that God needs to win in my situation. And I need to win. God also wants me to win. Otherwise, I will not serve the Lord. And ultimately, when he gave him a child in Genesis chapter 22, he asked him to sacrifice that child. And Abraham obeyed. That's when God said, now I know that you truly fear me. And that's when the true covenant was sealed forever. That's why you and I are now blessed with the believing Abraham. Based on that Genesis chapter 22, when he fully obeyed God, he did all that God wanted him to do. He became the father of the faith when he has done his part. So God won, and Abraham also won. And through him, all the families of the earth are blessed. Your blessing and my blessing are, are, are the blessings of Abraham, full, routed through Christ Jesus. The Jewish, the blessings, the Jewish nation, the blessing are through Abraham because they are the biological seed of Abraham. The Arabs, the blessing is through Abraham because uh, they are the biological sons of Abraham, but through Ishmael, truly through Abraham, all the families of the earth are blessed. So we've seen the why of God in the life of Abraham, the what, what was God after? He was after a seed so that he would redeem through that seed, the whole of mankind. So when Abraham did that prophetic action with his seed Isaac in Genesis chapter 22 by offering him as a sacrifice, he gave access to God to also give his son, Jesus, to die on the cross for the salvation of the whole world. God can tell you his plan for to save the whole nation. But why will he tell you his plan if you have no intention of acting upon his plan? The secrets of God are with those who have the willingness to obey. If you just want to know God's secret and you have no intention of doing that, God will not waste his time to come and share his secret because they are, they are secret for a reason. 
God, God wants them to be carried out. In the life of Jacob, we are going to see the why, what, and how of God and of, uh, of Jacob. What was God after? Why was God uh, interested in the life of uh, Jacob? Because he was looking for a seed. He wanted now to create a nation of people, Israel. So that he's, a, he's not just one individual that is practicing righteousness, but a whole nation that is a practicing righteousness. Not just a family, but now a nation that is living the, in the righteousness. Why did Jesus send us? He, say, he sent us to make disciples of all nations. Not just to disciple individual. It starts with the individual that is saved, that disciples his family, Abraham that is saved, and disciples his family, uh, Exodus, uh, Genesis chapter 18. And his children after him and grandchildren, if God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then they become a nation that have uh, the same laws, that are practicing righteousness. God is after a whole nation, a whole continent. That is the plan of God to save the whole planet. If you care to know the plan of God, God is after every single soul. Exodus, uh, Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4 All souls are mine. He wants to reclaim all his children. They are his creation. He wants them to, to come back home. That's the plan of God, to save the whole of Great Britain, to save the whole of Europe. That's the plan of God. If you care to know what he's after. So he was now after creating a whole nation that have the same values, discipling a nation. And he wants to start that nation with Jacob. Israel. What is in need for, for, for Jacob? Jacob saw that his grandfather, Abraham, was blessed, had the money, had the servant, had the, he said, oh, I want that blessing of Abraham. I want it, I want it, I want it, I want it. But he was not qualified for that. It was his elder brother that was qualified, Esau. And Esau thought it was automatic that he would get the blessing. If you don't want to comply with this book, you are not going to receive the blessings of the Lord either. Deuteronomy chapter 28 sets the curses on one, the blessing on one side, the curses on the other side. If you do what God says, his blessing will come upon you, would overtake you. If you do the opposite, the curses will come upon you. So the Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 12 that Esau was a profane person, a sexually immoral person. He did not have any regard for the blessing, the, the firstborn right. He just wanted the the blessing. He did not love God back. He was just interested in what the blessing could do in his life. So Jacob cried out to God. He say, this is the man that you have appointed to receive the blessing, and he does not want it. He despises it. I, I'm coveting the blessing. Why don't you give it to me? God says, ah, your heart is in the right place. The heart of Jacob was in the right place, but his method, the how of Jacob was wrong. Many Christians, when they come to Christ, their heart is in the right place, but the ways are not the ways of God. That was the problem of uh, Jacob. And that's why he wasted 20 years of his life until he had to comply with the ways of God. So he tricked his father to get the blessing. He got the blessing. But he suffered for that because his ways were not the ways of God. For 20 good years, from Genesis chapter 27, when he got the blessing, to Genesis chapter uh, 32, for 20 years, he had nothing. He had a blessing in his life. That's why many Christians also, they are born again. But the ways are not the ways of God. Crooked, 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 crooked. Trying to trick everybody. And they are getting nowhere in life. It is not the devil that is resisting them. It is God that is resisting them. Because you can't be a child of God and act like the child of the devil. God will not bless it. You can cry uh, like Esau, uh, Hebrew chapter 12, say Esau cried with all his tears. Father, don't you have any other blessing? Jacob said, I have no other blessing. If you reject the way Christians are supposed to live, then God has no blessing for you either. So Jacob received the blessing, but his ways were not the ways of God. So he found a trickster, his father-in-law, that tricked him 10 times, changed his salary, 
until he cried out unto the Lord, God, how? Tell me the way. I know that my ways are not your ways. I found a master in a trickery, uh, my uh, father-in-law led them. So tell me the how. I know the why. You're looking for a nation now that is practicing righteousness. Okay, I understand it. I'm looking for the blessing of Abraham, starting with the money first of all, because I don't have any. I have nothing to show for it. Tell me how I need to go about it. Now you are talking. So in Genesis chapter 30, that's what we saw last time, that God showed you how to manipulate the DNA of the animals so that he would transfer legally now without tricking anyone by the power of the Holy Ghost that would manipulate the DNA of the animals through that prophetic action where he took the popular branch and uh, removed the, the skin of the popular uh, tree. And as those animals were drinking the water and mating before that cross, they were becoming pregnant and they were giving birth to the speckled, the striped, and uh, all the other animals that uh, were supposed to be the wage of, uh, of Jacob. And God legally transferred within a year all the wealth of uh, Laban to uh, Jacob legally without tricking anyone now. So once he was done, God said, okay, now you got what you wanted, but you are still not broken. So God encountered him in Genesis chapter 32, where he wrestled with the Lord Jesus all night and God broke him, removed the, the, the bone of his uh, hip. And then God changed his name from Jacob, the trickster, the usurper to Israel. You are now a prince with God. So God won. He had now a broken person that would obey him this time, that would stop tricking everybody, stealing from everybody, and calling himself a, a son of God. No. So God won. The Bible says that Jacob won. He, pre, he fought with angels and fought with uh, men, and Jacob prevailed. That's not true. Jacob prevailed, but God also prevailed. He prevailed. His, his life was spared. His brother did not kill him. When he met his brother in chapter 33, they embraced. There was reconciliation in the family. But also God had a nation now through Jacob. God also won. It was a win-win. Though in that Genesis when you read, and when Paul also says it, he says that uh, Jacob wrestled with God, angel and wrestled with God, and he prevailed. Yes, he prevailed. But God also prevailed. It was a win-win situation. God won. He got what he wanted from the very beginning. And he also got, uh, Jacob also got what he wanted. It should be a win-win in the name of Jesus. If we take the example of Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1, book of Hannah, uh, book of 1 Samuel chapter 1, Hannah also had a need. What was the need of Hannah? She wanted a baby. So why do you want a baby? God would ask you that question. What is your motive? No, because I'm going towards a forty, I want a baby. That's not good enough. Why do so what? Okay. God, after all, you say that we should be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. So I want to replenish the earth. I want a baby. Okay. But what is in need for me, God? All the other friends of mine, they've already given birth. In the case of in the case of Hannah, she had a rival, uh, Penina. And Penina was making fun of Hannah. You are a barren and so on and so forth. So she was weeping every year. They would come at the Shiloh for the festival. She was weeping, weeping, weeping. Oh God, give me a baby. Oh God, give me a baby. Why will God give you a baby? What is in it for God? What is the profit of God uh, for you to have a baby? No, I want a baby because my rival is making fun of me. Is that true? The same thing also with uh, Leah. And uh, Rachel, Rachel, I want a baby. My rival is having so many babies. Why? Auntie, she said, okay, if you give it to me, I will give it to him, to you. His name will be Judah. I will praise you now. No, the Judah was from, um, from Leah. Uh, her, her, her son's name was Joseph. God has added. He will serve you. And God said, now you are talking. I will remember you now. So Hannah also said to God, listen, listen, God, let us make a deal. I know that God had a need. God had a need. God has a need. He has always had a need. So you need to identify what is the need of God so that God would win and you would win as well. 
What was the need of God? God was looking for a prophet. He was looking for a new prophet and a new high priest. Why? Because initially he chose the family of uh, Eli. And they thought that because God said to them, he's going to be with them forever, they thought they could not live anyhow. The same thing with Christian. When God said to them, they have received eternal life, they think that now I can't live anyhow. So the Bible says, God regretted. He said, far be it from me. Second Samuel chapter 2, verse 30. He said, far be it from me. I regret. I would honor those who honor me, and I would lightly esteem those who despise me. By the way, you and your son are living. Your son, Eli, are sleeping with the women in the temple, taking more money. I regret. I would destroy you and your son. You will become Ichabod in glorious. I will remove the glory from Shiloh forever. And I will find someone else. So God was after a new high priest and a new prophet that would live a sancti not just a sanctified life, but a consecrated life. There's a difference between sanctification or holiness and consecration. So she knew what was going on in the church. So Hannah came and I said, God, every year I came looking for a child. That's okay. I did not have it. My motives were wrong. It was just for me that I wanted that child. Okay, now I know you have a need. You want a prophet that will replace the sons of Eli and Eli that will lead your nation into righteousness. I have a womb. You are looking for a son. If you give me a son, God, that's the vow she made. If you give me a son, I would give him back to you. He would be not just uh, serving you, but you would be a Nazarite like Samson, like uh, John the Baptist, a Nazarite from my womb. I will no longer even drink uh, wine or the fruit, grape juice, none of that. I would even from my womb, from this day, I consecrate myself so that that child also is consecrated. And when he's born, I would just wait until he's wind and I will bring him back to you. God, do we have a deal? God said, now you are talking, my daughter. You've identified that I had a need. So I will do that for Eli. I said to her, go home. Your petition has been answered. So when she was, uh, the child was born, she brought that uh, Nazarite child to Eli. And they explained to Eli that I made a vow to God. I had a deal with God. God was looking for a prophet. I had a womb. I was looking for a son. That's it. But did God forgive, forget her? No. As you read First Samuel chapter 1, God gave five other sons after uh, Samuel. So God knew, okay, you've given me one. Hallelujah, thank you. But I know you still need other sons. So receive five others in the name of uh, Jesus. So she, it was a win-win. God had his prophet that was consecrated to him from the mother's womb. That would be the judge of Israel, the deliverer that will replace that family of Eli that were causing him headaches, that were dishonoring him. It was a win-win on both sides. If we move on to the case of uh, Ruth, Ruth, you can read uh, the three chapters of Ruth. God was looking for the Messiah uh, to bring a, a full family, Christ Jesus. Just like with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob, God is still looking for a family that the seed would continue to come down, down, down until Christ Jesus. And here was a stranger, a Moabitess. Her husband died. She had nothing. She was a poor, 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 poor. God is not after your money. The man that would marry is not after your money. She had immigration problem. She, she relocated in Israel from Moab to Israel. So she had immigration. They had no more land. So you don't need to have a property. You don't need to have a flat. You don't need to have papers. None of that matters in love. None of that. And anyone that will ask you those things before, he does not love you. Or anyone that will use your immigration to take advantage of you, he does not love you. Anyone that would would, would Ask anything in return for your love, for marriage. He does not love you at all. So, but the Moabites roof said to Naomi, you know what? 
I, don't entreat me to go back from following you. I've become a Christian. Your people, uh, for them, it was a Jew. For us, a Christian, your people, the Jews, for us, the Christian, your people will be my people. Your God that you are serving, Yahweh, through Christ Jesus, is also now my God. I'm not going to leave you. God sees our motives. Is it just a marriage that we are looking for, or do we truly love God? So, uh, sister-in-law Ofra decided to, to, to go back because she wanted marriage and she could not get it to fool, uh, fool Naomi anymore. She went to marry a pagan. So go and marry a pagan. Is that what you want? God is not unjust. Whatever you do for God, whatever stance you, you take for God, God is not unjust to forget your labor of love. He knows that you had other options to disobey him. But because you chose to obey him, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10, God is not unjust to forget your labor of love. Not just any labor, your labor of love that you have bestowed in his name, in that you are serving uh, the people, you, and you continue to serve. He will never forget. In the book of Isaiah chapter 46, verse 19, Isaiah 46, verse 19, the Lord says, I have not spoken in secret. God did not speak it in secret in the chamber. No, he spoke it openly. I have not spoken in secret in the dark place of the earth. I did not say to the seed of Jacob, you are now where the seed of Jacob. Seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. So God did not say to you, to you, seek him in vain. You are never seeking God in vain. He's the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So Ruth diligently sought to the Lord. She followed uh, Naomi. And when she arrived there, there were other people that were young or richer and so on and so forth. She could get out of immigration uh, quickly, get the house quickly. She did not do that. She held on to her integrity. People are watching you, and God also is uh, watching you. And then she met Boaz. Boaz says she he will do the right thing. He, he knew about the reputation. He knew about how she has served the Lord, how she has forsaken everything to come and serve the Lord. And Ruth and Naomi, they were very close. Actually, it was Naomi that was pulling the strings behind uh, uh, Ruth. So uh, how do you call him? Uh, uh, Boaz knew it. So basically, the, the, the decision of uh, Ruth was truly not the decision of Ruth. It was actually the decision of uh, uh, Naomi. So he knew, he said, I will do the right uh, thing. So she followed the Lord. God was looking for the Messiah. She decided to abandon everything to serve the God of the Jews, and God honored her. She gave birth to Obed, Obed gave birth to Jesse, and Jesse gave birth to David. And David, down the line, Christ Jesus came. God has a plan. May you enter into the great plan of God today in the name of Jesus. God has a why, he has a what, and he has a how. The why behind God is always uh, love because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting uh, love, uh, everlasting life. Then your motivations and my motivation must always be love. Our, the why of God and our why must line up together. In the beginning, it might not have been so, like in, uh, in the life of uh, Father Peter in Luke chapter 5, it was only after fish. In Luke chapter 5, it was only after fish. So it initially was because of the fish that he followed Jesus. In Matthew chapter 17, he had taxes to pay, so Jesus paid for his taxes. But in that uh, John chapter 21, after Jesus rose from the dead, appeared to them three times, Peter said, you know what? This Christianity thing, I don't think I'm able to pay my bills. I'm going back fishing. So Jesus gave him a miracle of uh, catching the, the fish again, like in Luke chapter 5. 
And Jesus said to him, do you love me more than this? Peter, truly. I know initially you just came for the money, for sorry, for the fish. And I've done all those miracles and so on and so forth. But I want now to check, are you reciprocating that love that I have for you? The motives of you serving me, is it now the same as the motive that I'm doing all those things in your life? Do you love me more than the fish? Do you love me more than the marriage? Do you love me more than getting papers? David, do you love me more than getting a wife, getting the riches and getting uh, exemption from taxes? Abraham, do you love me more than just having a child? Can you surrender that child back to me? And if Moses, uh, sorry, uh, Abraham passed the test in Genesis chapter 22. He surrendered even that Isaac to the Lord when he offered him in sacrifice. David passed the test. May we pass the test as well. And for Peter, it was so hard. He said, Lord, you know I'm your friend. I love you as a friend. Because I'm not talking about loving me as a friend. A friend sticks closer than a brother. When I was being crucified, you fled. You denied me three times. That's not what friends do. Do you love me unconditionally, Agape? Do you burn with a passion for me? Peter said, no, I just love you as a friend. Then he says, okay, let's start as a friend at least. And then we will take it to agape, agape love. So in everything that we do in dealing with people, love must be the real motivation. Whatever, even in doing the, the work of the kingdom, are you after the money? Why was David fighting the lion and the bear? In that the first time in chapter 17, he fought the lion, he fought the bear to rescue the hue lamb of his father because he loved his father. He knew that the father cared about those, uh, lamb, those lambs. So I know if it is torn by, the, by a beast, my father would be in pain. So I will lay down my life. His brethren, they did not care. They asked David, with whom have you left those a few sheep of our father? We know the insolence of your heart. But for David, he was willing to lay down his life for the sheep of his father, for the lamb. Of course, a sheep can give birth to other sheep. But why are you risking your life fighting a bear, fighting a lion? God sees in secret and rewards us openly. He fought the lion in secret. He fought the bear in secret. God saw that he was willing to lay down his life for the sheep. So he can also lay down his life for my sheep, Israel, my nation. Luke chapter 16 is clear. If you cannot be found faithful in what is least, God will never commit unto you what is a much. Many people are saying to God, God, when I will have this, I will do this. God is laughing. What are you doing with what you have? So, if you are willing, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19, if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. If you and I are willing and obedient in every aspect of life, like Abraham, like Isaac, like Jacob, like Ruth, like uh, Hannah, like uh, Samuel, like David, we would eat the good of the land. God will give us the desires of your heart. Delight in the Lord your God, and he will give you the desires of, the, of your heart. David fought the lion. He was a good shepherd. In John chapter 10, Jesus is talking about the good shepherd. He, lay, he goes before his sheep. He fights the, the wolves, the lion, the bear. He lays down his life for his sheep. A mercenary, a hireling, the French version said the mercenary. Uh, the English version says the hireling. But actually, a hireling is a mercenary. A mercenary is a gun for, for, for hire. He doesn't care about the sheep. He only uh, are fighting because he's only fast fighting because of uh, the money. And when he sees uh, the lion comes or the wolf come, he leaves the sheep, he goes away because he, he doesn't see it uh, 
worth laying down his life. Many times when I was coming from Manchester to Glasgow, God would say to me, are you a hireling or are you a shepherd? I said, I'm not any mercenary. I'm not after anyone's money. Money or no money, I'm going to preach to your people. Even if it is for one sheep, I used to come all the way from Manchester for just one person. He would say, to, why don't you just close the church? Because I know you may not see, but the father that sees in secret how David is fighting for one person. How can you think about 300,000 families and millions of souls across Europe if you cannot even fight for one sheep? The, the gospel is not just empty words. God would watch you. What are you doing? Ryan Abanke for four years in Lesotho, there were only four people coming in his uh, church. And none of those four people would give their life to Christ. But God was saying to me, you are going to save Africa, millions of souls are going to be saved through your meeting. And he only had four people in his meeting for five good years, and none of them would give their life to Christ. God was saying, can you be faithful with those four? Write those Bible studies for maybe just those four, and you wrote those Bibles. I record them, you record them for only four people, and none of them was giving their life to Christ. David Youngie Cho, he only had four people in his church with himself five. His future mother-in-law was there. His future mother also was in that church. His uh, mother-in-law of today, so the, she was, was a church member, was saying to him, why are you shouting here, uh, young Cho? He said, I'm not preaching to you. I'm preaching to, those, uh, uh, to that one million that God has said to me. He was faithful with those uh, four. Like David was faithful defending the few lamb of his father. If you can't be trusted what you with what is least, God will not entrust you with much. God, when I will have this, I would obey. God said, no, you are a liar. Let God be true and every man a liar. If you can't be found faithful in what is least, God cannot commit unto you what is much. So in the beginning is love. God expresses love because God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. He's asking us to reciprocate that love. When it comes to family, there needs to be target love, family love, like Ruth and uh, Naomi, like uh, Jephro and the uh, and the uh, uh, and you call it and the uh, and the uh, Moses. Your people become his people, and your people become her people. There should be physical attraction. J Jacob uh, was attracted by uh, Rachel. Sarah was very beautiful. The Bible says in the eyes of uh, Abraham, uh, Rebecca was very beautiful in the eyes of uh, uh, Isaac. Because you are going to spend the rest of your life with that person. The motivation behind it. And there should be friendship because uh, beauty is, uh, is fading. The person would not remain the way he is. She would age. She would have children. She would put on some weight. The man also would go bold in the name of Jesus. Or he would have gray hair. He would grow a big belly. So if you were looking for the six pack, the six packs will no longer be there in 10 years. So there should be more than just a physical attraction. There should be friendship. Filios with God also. There should be more than just uh, what we can get from God. There should be friendship. Let's start at least with friendship. Peter said, I love you as a friend. I don't love you unconditionally yet, but I love you as a friend. So let's now go to agape love. And then ultimately, there should be agape love, unconditional love. That in sickness, in health, you stay with the person. In riches and in poverty, you stay with the person. And many times, God would be vetting our motives. Jerry, are you doing that because of the money? Or are you doing that because you are a shepherd after my own heart like David? I know that uh, you need this like David. He, had a, he asked the question, what will I get in it? Peter asked that question. He said to Jesus, listen, we've left everything to follow you. What are we going to receive? Jesus said to Peter, I'm telling the truth. There is no one that has left the house, the land, the wives, the children. For my sake and that of the gospel, that will not receive a hundredfold. In this life, we've persecution. And the life to come, they will receive also eternal life. So Peter asked those questions. What is it in it for, for us? Are we just serving the Lord in vain? 
say to the seed of Jacob that it is not in vain that you are serving me. So God is asking you and I, my son, give me your heart. Over in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 26, he says, my son, my daughter, give me your heart. And let your eyes delight in my ways, or observe my ways. So give me your heart. God is after your heart. Jerry is after your heart. He's after your soul. And when we were doing the healing crusade in Barhead, when uh, the Lord told me that the people are only after the healing, they are not after me. They don't want me at all. They want to continue to live in sin and so on and so forth. They don't want me at all. So shut it down. I shut it down. People called me. Uh, People are dying of cancer. Why don't you come and pray for them? I kept quiet. They insulted me. I said, my will is now the will of my father. The, my why has become the why of my father. My father is after the soul. He's after children. He wants to load them with benefits, but he wants them to become his children. They don't want to become his children. They just want the benefits. So God now has discovered the heart. He says, shut it down. Like in John chapter 6, Jesus said, you are only looking for me because of the bread that you ate last time and because of the healing. I want you to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they all left. And Jesus turned to the 12 said, are you also living? Peter said, to whom shall we go? In you, we have found the word of eternal life. We've come to know and to believe that you are the Messiah. We're not looking for anyone else. You are the real deal. We are staying with you. So do we truly love God? Do we have the same motives? God is still looking for a man and a woman today. In the book of Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, he said, I look for a man. Whom shall we send and who will go for us? Isaiah volunteered, here I am. Send me. But the fact that you volunteer is not enough. I say, Isaiah, it's good that you volunteered, yes, but there is no holiness in your life. I can't use you. Your, my, your ways are not my ways. You are a man of iniquity. I need to purge you if I, can, if I can use you. So you volunteer, that's good. But you are not meeting the requirement. Are you willing to be purged for me to use you? Isaiah volunteered, yes, purge me, Lord. And the angel took a burning coal after the altar of incense and purged Isaiah. And he was now useful into the kingdom. Ezekiel 22, the Lord says, I'm looking for a man that will stand in the gap so the people will not be destroyed. God is still looking for a man and a woman. God has a need. He has a need. He has a need. He wants to save Europe. He's looking for a man. Rainer Banke is dead. He's looking for a man. He's just like an office. When the, the director has retired, for them, they have retired, they have graduated to heaven. The office is still vacant. So someone need to fill those shoes. The office of Moses was still vacant. So Joshua had to fill that office. The office of Peter is still vacant for our generation. He's looking for a man, but that man need to meet, the, or a woman, but that woman will need to meet the criteria of God for him to be able to be used. He's looking for a man to replace Eli and his son. But it should be a son that is consecrated. So Hannah understood I'm giving you a consecrated child from my womb. God is still looking. Identify the need of God. And make a deal with God. And sometimes God will come and tell you, this, this is the problem that I have. I'm looking for someone. Do you want to volunteer? He would ask you your will. And you can say, yes, no. God, I'm happy just where I am. And God said, okay. But I want you to do that. God has a need. And if you start answering the needs of God, you'll see God will be talking with you a lot, sharing his secret with you because he has a need. And as you are doing God's uh, will, he will also meet your own need. Delight in the Lord your God, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So my son, my daughter, he says to you, Give me your heart. If God has your heart, he has everything else. He has uh, your devotion. When a woman marries and she truly loves her husband, she goes everywhere. I have uh, Papa, Papa Pierre, Mama Dodé. They left, uh, Mama Dodé left the Congo Brazzaville to join Papa Pierre in uh, Germany. 
She left everything behind, her friend, her career as a, as a medical doctor to join the love of her life in Germany. When now they fell in love with Jesus, hallelujah, they left Germany to go to Sierra Leone and Liberia during the war time to be missionaries. Love, the agape love, unconditional love. So God is calling us to a higher love. Just like a fish, that's why God likens marriage to the relationship with God as well. Because when you truly fall in love with God, you would go anywhere with him. To my son, my daughter, give me your heart. You would treat that person as a princess and you would treat him as a king because he's a king, you are a princess. You not insult him, put him down, call him stupid, call him idiot. No, you would cherish him just like Christ cherishes and nourishes the church. My son, give me your heart. God loves you. He wants you to love him back. He wants your motivation to be love and my motivation to be love. And in the house of prayer for all nations, may God keep us safe that we would love one another. The first commandment here, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You shall love him with all your heart, with all your strength, and with all your might. And the second command is like the same. The first one, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the new commandment Jesus is given unto us, we shall love one another as Christ Jesus exemplified his love towards us by laying down his life, not having a selfish ambition. But the other person also need to benefit in the relationship in the name of Jesus. I should treat him the way Christ is treating me in the name, not defrauding anyone, shall we pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. We want to give you all the glory and all the praise. Father, as we come before you in all of our petitions about marriages, about finances, about business, about the ministry, shepherding the people, careers, marriages, how to restore a marriage, you have your reasons. You have uh, the benefits that you want to extract out of those relationships. And you have your ways of doing it because your ways are not your ways. Our thoughts are not our thoughts. We also have our own reasons. Sometimes they are selfish. Most of the time they are selfish. You know our heart. The heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? So you know it already. You search our loins and our thoughts. You reveal the thoughts and intentions of the heart. We know it already. We also have uh, benefits that we want from uh, serving you and obeying you in our marriages, in our career, in our immigration, every aspect in ministry. We also have our own benefits that we want to, to have in return. And you say that you would load us daily with benefit if we are willing and obedient to your ways now. You would open our eyes to your ways. As the Proverbs 23, verse 26 says, that... You are going to open our eyes to your ways as we give you our heart. Father, let us surrender our heart so that we can serve you acceptably in everything that we are doing so that we would have a win-win relationship. You are going to save all of our family members. As I'm praying for my family members to be saved, do I just want them to break up with those uh, bad relationships or do I want them to be saved? God is not just after breaking up that relationship. He's after saving that son. That's what God is after. So unless I align myself with God, I want my son to be born again. Then I can pray for God to chase away that girlfriend or that boyfriend. It will not move God because your ways are not the ways of God. God wants the soul of that son. That's what he wants. He's after the son himself. He's a soul, his spirit, soul, and body. He's not just after removing him from drugs and so on and so forth. So when we even now praying for the 10 people in our family, let's not just pray that God deliver that from drug, from alcohol, from uh, pornography and adultery. No, 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 no. That's not just what you're after. You are after first of all the soul of that person. As we are praying for our loved one, those 10 people, let us identify what you are truly after. You are truly after the soul of the people. All souls are yours. And as we preach the gospel, let us identify truly what you are after. You are after the souls of every one of us, all of our family members, all of our spouses, in the name of Jesus. We thank you. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for your precious.